pin plates and panels and shells are continually cropping up both in nature and in technology, and, the larger and the thinner these structures are, the more likely they are to deflect or crumble under bending and compressive loads. In principle, anything which stiffens a column or a panel in bending will also increase its resistance to buckling and so make it stronger in compression. One way of doing this is by staying a strut or a panel with ropes or wires, this is a solution which is never used in plants. Alternatively, and perhaps preferably, one can stiffen the member with ribs or stringers, by corrugating it, or by making it of cellular construction. Wood is a cellular material, and so are most other plant tissues, notably the stem walls of grasses and bamboos. Furthermore, in the competitive struggle for existence, many plants depend critically upon the structural efficiency of their leaves, because they must try to expose the maximum area to sunlight, for photosynthesis, at the minimum metabolic cost. Leaves are therefore important panel structures, and they seem to make use of most of the known structural devices to increase their stiffness in bending. Nearly all leaves are provided with an elaborate rib structure asterisk, the membranes between the ribs are stiffened by being of cellular construction, and in some cases they are further stiffened by corrugations. In addition to all this, the leaf as a whole is stiffened hydrostatically by the osmotic pressure of the sap. In engineering structures, panels, and shells are very often stiffened by means of ribs or stringers which are glued or riveted or welded to the plating, though this is not always the lightest or the cheapest way of doing the job. Another way of tackling the problem is to make the shell plating in two separate layers which are then spaced apart by being glued to some kind of continuous support, usually made as light as possible. Arrangements of this kind are called sandwich constructions. In modern times sandwich panels were first used for serious constructional purposes by Mr. Edward Bishop, de Havilland's famous chief designer, for the fuselage of the now forgotten comet aircraft of the 193 OS. It is probably best known for its use in the successor to this aeroplane, the wartime Mosquito. In both these aircraft the core of the sandwich was made of lightweight balsa wood, with skins of heavier and stronger birch plywood glued to either side. Though the Mosquito was a most successful aircraft, balsa wood is apt to soak up water and rot. Moreover, supplies of this rather soft and fragile tropical wood are limited in quantity and variable in quality. As things turned out, research on core materials for sandwich shells and panels was much stimulated at about this time by another factor altogether, this was the introduction of airborne radar. With this equipment the moving radar reflector or scanner had to be housed and protected by putting it inside a large streamlined dome or fairing, which soon came to be known as a radome. Naturally these fairings had to be transparent to high frequency radio waves, and this meant that, in practice, they had to be made from some sort of plastic, usually fiberglass or perspex. The transparency of the radome shell to radar could be much improved, at least in theory, by the use of a sandwich construction whose thickness was carefully related to the wavelength of the radiation which was being transmitted, in exactly the same way as the thickness of the coating or blooming. On a modern camera lens is related to the wavelength of visible light. Damp balsa, like any other damp wood, is nearly opaque to radar and under wartime conditions. Not only for the cores of radome sandwiches but for all sorts of other structural sandwich panels as well. Some of them are still in use today. They are used, for instance, in boat building because the walls of their cells or cavities are nearly impervious to water. However, for the cores of sandwich panels of the highest structural efficiency, resin foams are rather heavier and rather less stiff than one might wish. In other words, the market for lightweight core materials was more or less an open one. Figure 15. Foamed resins are often used as lightweight core materials in sandwich constructions. One day, towards the end of 1943, a circus proprietor called George May called to see me at Farnborough. After he had told me several Gerald Durrell-type stories about the difficulties of keeping monkeys in traveling circuses, 
he produced something which looked like a cross between a book and a concertina. When he pulled on the ends of this invention, the whole thing opened out like one of those colored paper festoons which people use for Christmas decorations. It was in fact a sort of paper honeycomb of very lightweight but of quite surprising strength and stiffness. Did I think that such a thing could be of any use in aircraft? The snack, as George May modestly admitted, was that, since it was only made from brown paper and ordinary gum, it had no moisture resistance at all and would fall to bits if it got wet. This must have been one of the relatively few occasions in history when a group of aircraft engineers have been seriously tempted to throw their collective arms around the neck of a circus proprietor and kiss him. However, we resisted the temptation and told May that there could be no serious difficulty in waterproofing the paper honeycomb by means of a synthetic resin. This was exactly what we did, figure 16. The paper from which the honeycomb was to be made was impregnated before use with a solution of uncured phenolic resin. After the honeycomb had been made and expanded, the resin was cured and hardened by baking it in an oven. As a result the paper was not only made waterproof but also strengthened and stiffened. This material was very successful and was used in the cores of sandwiches for all kinds of military purposes. Though it is not used a great deal in aircraft nowadays, something like half the household doors in the world are made by gluing thin sheets of plywood or plastic on either side of a paper honeycomb. It is even more widely used abroad, especially in America, than in England, and the world production of paper honeycomb must be very considerable. Figure 16. Construction and use of paper honeycomb. A. Resin impregnated paper is printed with parallel stripes of glue. B. Many sheets are glued together into a thick block with glue stripes staggered. C. When the glue is set, the block of material is expanded into a honeycomb. After this the resin is hardened. D. Slabs of honeycomb are glued between sheets of ply, plastic or metal to form a structural sandwich. Although the use of sandwich construction, foamed resin cores and honeycombs is relatively new in engineering, it has been used for a very long time in biology. What is called cancel louse bone. Figure 17 exploits this principle. Each of us carries around quite a good example in the bones of our skulls, which are, of course, subject to bending and buckling loads. Figure 17. Cancel louse bone. Asterisk the result may be a concentration of mass so dense that its own gravitational field is strong enough to prevent, not only the escape of any matter but also the departure of all forms of radiation. Thus no two-way communication is possible with such an area, and these regions of the universe are forever barred to us. These localities are known as black holes like the island in Sir James Barry's eerie play Mary Rose, they like to be visited but nothing can ever return. Asterisk in so far as failure in both tension and compression tend to occur by shearing, as in ductile metals, the tensile and compressive strengths would be identical. However, there are so many exceptions to this rule as to make it practically valueless. Asterisk note that many seaweeds, which are made largely from alginic acid, a weak and brittle substance, are pre-stressed in the same sense as reinforced concrete. Just as reinforced concrete economizes in steel, so seaweeds economize in the scarce, strong component, cellulose. Asterisk as a crack or a compression crease with a straight front, like a saw cut, penetrates across a round section its surface area may increase more rapidly than the rate of release of strain energy from the material behind it. And so Griffith is frustrated. Asterisk pronounced Euler. Asterisk except, of course, is increasing blindness in later life. Asterisk several modern proofs of Euler's formula are to be found in the textbooks. See, for instance, the mechanical properties of matter by Sir Alan Cottrell. Asterisk in a thin walled circular tube local buckling will generally occur when the stress in the skin reaches a value equivalent to where it equals wall thickness or equals radius of 2V equals Young's modulus. Part 4 and the consequence was
or the shape, the weight, and the cost. Philosophy is nothing but discretion. John Selden, 1584-1654 As we have seen, very much the commonest day-to-day -day practical use of structural theory is in analyzing the behavior of some specific structure, either one which it is proposed to build, one which is actually in existence but whose safety is in question, or else one which has, rather embarrassingly, already collapsed. In other words, if we know the dimensions of a given structure and the properties of the materials from which it is made, we can at least try to predict how strong it ought to be and how much it will deflect. However, although calculations of this sort are clearly very useful in particular instances, this kind of approach is only of limited help to us when we want to understand why things are the shape they are or when we want to choose which. Out of several different classes of structure, would be best for a particular service. For instance, in making an aeroplane or a bridge, would it be better to use a continuous shell structure made from plates or panels or else a criss-cross lattice arrangement built up from rods or tubes and braced, perhaps, with wires? Again, why do we have so many muscles and tendons and comparatively few bones? Furthermore, how is the engineer ever to select from the large variety of materials which are usually available? Should he make his structure from steel or aluminium, from plastic or from wood? The design of plants and animals and of the traditional artifacts did not just happen. As a rule both the shape and the materials of any structure which has evolved over a long period of time in a competitive world represent an optimization with regard to the loads which it has to carry and to the financial or the metabolic cost. We should like to achieve this sort of optimization in modern technology, but we are not always very good at it. It is not widely realized that this subject, which is sometimes called the philosophy of design can be studied in a scientific way. This is a pity, because the results are important, both in biology and in engineering. Although not much regarded, the study of the philosophy of design has, in fact, been going on for quite a number of years. The first serious engineering approach to the subject was made by A. G. M. Mitchell around 1900. Asterisk though biologists had been making remarks about the square cube law, chapter 9, Practically since it was propounded by Galileo, it was not until 1917 that Sir Darcy Thompson published his beautiful book on growth and form, still in print, which was the first general account of the influence of structural requirements on the shapes of plants and animals. For all its many virtues, the book is not a very numerate one, and the engineering views expressed are not always sound. Though greatly, and justly, praised, Growth and form did not have much real influence on biological thinking, either in its own time or for long afterwards. It does not seem to have influenced engineers very much either, no doubt because the time for an interaction between the great Thomas Young. For he shares not only something of Young's genius, but also a good deal of Young's obscurity of presentation. I am afraid lesser mortals often find Cox's expositions difficult to follow without the aid of an evangelist or interpreter. This may account for the fact that his work has received less attention than it deserves. Much of what follows is based on Cox, directly or indirectly. Let us begin with his analysis of tension structures. It is a curiosity of engineering design that it is impossible to fashion a simple tension member without first devising some end fitting through which the load may be applied, and whether the material be wrought iron or liana, wire rope, or string. The stress system in the end fitting is a great deal more complicated than simple tension. There is plenty of scope for theory in the design of tension end fittings, but there is also a great deal of experience and whether the competition is from the ancient pygmies' mastery of the craft of making knots in Leonis, or from Brunei's development of efficient eye bars, experience will often dictate the design. Still the theorist has the final word. H. L. Cox, The Design of Structures of Least Weight, Pergamon, 1965. If we did not have to consider the effect of end fittings the philosophy of tension structures would be very simple indeed. For one thing, 
the weight of a tension structure fitted to carry a given load would be proportional to its length. That is to say, a rope strong enough to carry a load of one ton over a distance of 100 meters would weigh just a hundred times as much as a rope safe to carry the same load over one meter. Furthermore, provided that the load were evenly shared, it would make no difference whether a given load were supported by one single rope or tie bar, or by two ropes or bars each having half the cross section. This simple view is upset by the necessity for end fittings, that is to say, by the need to get the load in at one end of the member and out at the other. Even an ordinary rope will need a knot or a splice at each end. The knot or splice will be relatively heavy and may cost money. If we are to do an honest reckoning this weight and cost will have to be added to that of the bare tension member itself. The weight and the cost of the end fittings will be just the same, for a given load, whether the rope be long or short. Thus, other things being equal, the weight and cost of a tension member per unit length will be less for a long member than for a short one. In other words the weight is not directly proportional to the length. Again, it can be shown from the algebra and geometry of such a system, that the total weight of the end fittings of two tension bars, operating in parallel, is less than that of the end fittings of a single rope or bar of equivalent cross-section. Asterisk it follows that, in general, weight is saved by subdividing a tensile load between two or more tension members instead of carrying it in a single one. As Cox points out, the stress distribution in end fittings is always complex and must include more or less severe stress concentrations, from which cracks will spread if they get the chance. Thus both the weight and the cost of the fittings will depend both upon the skill of the designer and also upon the toughness, that is to say, the work of fracture, of the material. The higher the work of fracture, the lighter and the cheaper the fitting will be. However, as we saw in Chapter 5, toughness is likely to diminish as tensile strength increases. In the case of common engineering metals, like steel, the work of fracture falls dramatically with increase of tensile strength. Thus in choosing a material for a tension member we are commonly faced with incompatible requirements. To reduce the weight of the middle or parallel part of a tie bar we should like to use a material of high tensile strength. For the end fittings we generally want a tough material, which is end fittings at the anchorages of the cables. Which is only likely to imply the acceptance of a low tensile strength. Like many difficulties, this one may be solved by a compromise, which in the case in this case depends chiefly on the length of the member. For very long members, such as the wire cables of a modern suspension bridge, it will generally pay to choose a high tensile steel, even if we have to accept extra weight and complication in connection with the end fittings at the anchorages of the cables. End fittings at the anchorages of the cables. After all, there are only two of these, one at each end of the bridge, while there is perhaps a mile of wire in between. Thus the saving of weight over the middle part will more than compensate for any losses at the ends. But when we come to things like chains with shortish lengths, the situation is totally different. In each short length the weight of the end fittings may well be greater than that of the middle part and must be carefully considered. This is the case with the supporting chains of the older suspension bridges. Such things were generally made from a tough and ductile wrought iron of quite low tensile strength. As we said in Chapter 10, the tensile stress in the plate links of Telford's Mina bridge chains is less than a tenth of that in the wires of a modern suspension bridge, for this excellent reason. Very similar arguments apply to shell structures such as ships and tanks and boilers and girders which are fabricated from comparatively small plates of iron or steel. It also applies to riveted aluminium structures, such as conventional aircraft. All these may be considered more or less as two-dimensional chains with rather small lengths.
In such cases it pays to use a weaker but more ductile material, otherwise the weight of the joints would be prohibitive. See Chapter 5, Figure 13, P106. The multiplication of ropes and wires in ships and biplanes and tents generally results in a saving, rather than an increase, of weight. Asterisk naturally, all this cat's cradle business incurs the penalty of high wind resistance, high maintenance costs and general complication. This is the price we may have to pay for low structure weight. A similar principle can be seen in animals, where nature does not hesitate to multiply tension members such as muscles and tendons. Indeed she adopts the same device as the Elizabethan seaman to reduce the weight of end attachments. The ends of many tendons are splayed out into a fan-shaped contrivance which Sir Francis Drake would have called a crow's foot. Each branch of the tendon has a separate little joint to the bone. Thus the weight, and perhaps the metabolic cost, is minimized. As we saw in the last chapter, the breaking stresses in tension and in compression for a given solid are often different, but for many common materials, such as steel, the difference is not very great. And so the weights of short tension and compression members are likely to be fairly similar. In fact, because a compression member may not need to have heavy end fittings, whereas a tension member does, a short compression strut may well be lighter, for comparable conditions, than a tension bar. However, as a strut gets longer, Dr. Euler begins to make himself felt. It will be remembered that the buckling load of a long column varies as L slash L2, where L is the length, and this implies that, for a rod of constant cross-section, the compressive strength diminishes very rapidly with increase of length. Thus, to support any given load, a long strut has to be made very much thicker, and therefore heavier, than a short one. As we said in the last section, the same consideration does not apply to tension members. It is revealing to study the problem of carrying one ton, 1,000 kilograms or 10,000 newtons, over a distance of 10 meters, 33 feet, first in tension and then in compression. In tension, for a steel rod or a cable we might allow a working stress of, say, 330 mn slash m2 or 50,000 psi in tension. Taking into account the end fittings, the total weight comes out at about 3 to 5 kg or about 8 pounds. In compression. To try to carry such a load in compression over such a distance by means of a solid steel rod would be silly, because if a solid rod were thick enough to avoid buckling it would need to be very heavy indeed. In practice we might well use a steel tube, which would have to be about 16 centimeters, 6 inches, in diameter with a wall thickness of, say, 5 millimeters, 0 to 2 inch. Such a tube would weigh 200 kilograms or about 450 pounds. In other words it would weigh between 50 and 60 times as much as the tension rod. The cost might well be in the same proportion. Furthermore, if we should want to subdivide a compression structure the situation gets not better but much worse. If we wanted to support a load of one ton, not by a single strut, but by some table-like arrangement of four struts, each 10 meters long, then the total weight of the struts would be twice as great, that is to say, 400 kilograms or 900 pounds. The weight goes on increasing the more the structure is subdivided, in fact as square root n where n is the number of columns. See Appendix 4. On the other hand, if we increase the load, keeping the distance the same, then the weight of a compression structure becomes relatively better. For instance, if we increase the load a hundredfold, that is, from one ton to one hundred tons, then, though the weight of a tension member has gone up at least in proportion from 3 to 5 kg to 350 kilograms, yet the weight of a single strut to carry this load over 10 meters increases only tenfold, that is, from about 200 kilograms to about 2,000 kilograms. So, in compression, it is proportionately very much more economical to support a heavy load than a light one. Figure 1. 
All these considerations operate in the same sort of way for panels and shells and plates and membranes as for simple struts and poles and columns. Appendix 4. Figure 1. Diagram illustrating the relative weight cost of carrying a given load over a distance L. Considerations of this kind provide the rationale of things like tents and sailing ships. With such devices it pays, hands down, to collect the compression loads into a small number of masts or poles, contrived to be as short as possible. At the same time the tension loads, as we have said, are better diffused into as many strings and membranes as may be. Thus a bell tent, which has a single pole but many guy ropes, is likely to be the lightest building which can be made in proportion to its volume. However, almost any tent will generally be lighter and cheaper than a solid building made from timber or masonry. In the same way, a cutter, or a sloop, which has a single mast, is a lighter and more efficient rig than a catch or a schooner or any other more complicated arrangement with several masts. This is also the reason why the A-shaped or tripod masts used by the ancient Egyptians and by the designers of Victorian ironclads, chapter 11, were heavy and inefficient. Again, the typical vertebrate animal, such as man, is on the whole a good deal like a bell tent or a sailing ship. There is a small number of compression members, that is, bones, more or less in the middle. And these are surrounded by a wilderness of muscles and tendons and membranes, even more complicated than the ropes and sails of a full-rigged ship, which carry the tensions. Furthermore, from the structural point of view two legs are better than four, and the centipede is perhaps only saved from total inadequacy by the fact that its legs are so short. It will be remembered that, long ago, it occurred to Galileo that, Whereas the weight of a structure increased as the cube of its dimensions, the cross-sectional area of its load-carrying members increased only as the square. And so the stress in the material of geometrically similar structures ought to increase in direct proportion to the dimensions. Thus a structure which is liable to fail by tensile fracture induced, directly or indirectly, by its own weight must be made of thicker and stockier proportions the larger it becomes. In fact, its members would have to be made disproportionately thicker and heavier than the simple rule would indicate, because there is a sort of compound interest effect. Thus the size of all structures might be expected to be quite strictly limited. This square cube law has been bandied about by both biologists and engineers for a long time. Herbert Spencer and, later, Darcy Thompson said that it limited the size of animals, such as elephants and engineers used to explain that it rendered impracticable the building of ships or aircraft appreciably larger than those already in existence. In spite of this, both ships and aircraft continued to get bigger and bigger. As a matter of fact the square cube law seems to apply with full force only to the lintels of Greek temples, which are made from weak, heavy stone, icebergs and ice flows, which are made from weak, heavy ice, and things like jellies and blanc manges. As we have seen, in many sophisticated structures the weight of the compression members is likely to be many times greater than that of the tension parts. Since the compression members are likely to fail by buckling they will become more efficient the larger the load they are called upon to bear, that is to say, the larger the structure is made. For this reason, although there is a disproportionate increase of weight with increase of size, the penalty is very much smaller than is implied by the square cube law. In practice this penalty may be more than offset by various economies of scale, for instance, in a ship or a fish, an aircraft, or a bird, the resistance to motion will be nearly in the ratio of the surface area, and this area will diminish, proportionately to the weight, as the size increases. It was Brunei's perception of this which impelled him to design the Great Eastern. Brunei's perception was right, though his great ship was a failure, and this is why we build enormous ships, such as super tankers, today. Furthermore, as we saw in Chapter 5, the size of large animals is more likely to be limited by considerations related to the critical Griffith crack length in their bones than by the square cube law. Quite frequently the engineer is faced with the choice between a lattice structure built up 
mechano fashion. From separate struts and tension rods, which is called a space frame, and a shell structure in which the load is carried in more or less continuous panels, this is called a monocoque. Sometimes the distinction between the two forms of construction is obscured by the fact that space frames are covered over with some sort of continuous cladding which does not really carry much load. This is the case with traditional timbered cottages, with modern steel frame sheds and barns, which are covered with corrugated iron, and, of course, with animals which are covered with shells or scales. Sometimes the decision about which form to use is dictated by requirements which are not strictly structural. Thus an electricity pylon offers least wind resistance and least area of steel to paint when it is in the form of an open trellis or lattice tower. Again it is generally more convenient to make a water tank, for instance, from a shell of thickish steel plates than in the form of a trellis supporting a watertight bag or membrane, even though the latter form may be lighter and is, in fact, the solution usually adopted by nature for stomachs and bladders. Sometimes the difference in weight and cost between the two forms of construction is marginal and it may not matter very much which is used. In other cases the difference is very great. As we have seen, a tent is always much lighter and cheaper than any equivalent building made from continuous panels or concrete or masonry. In coach building the old-fashioned Veyman Saloon car body, circa 1930, which consisted of a wooden space frame covered with padded fabric, was very much lighter than any of the pressed metal shell bodies which have been used since. In these days of expensive petrol the Veyman body might well be revived. There is, however, an idea about that monocoque shells are somehow more modern and more advanced than space frames, which are sometimes considered to be primitive and rather Heath Robinson. Although a good many engineers who ought to know better subscribe to this view, there is in fact no objective structural justification for it. When it comes to carrying loads which are primarily compressive, the space frame is always lighter and usually cheaper than the monocoque. The weight penalty for using a monocoque, however, is less severe when the loads are high in relation to the dimensions, and this, in conjunction with other considerations, may justify the use of shells in some instances. However, for large, lightly loaded structures, such as rigid airships, the space frame or trellis structure is the only practicable one. The alternative for lighter than air transport is not a vast monocoque airship made from an engineer's dream of shiny aluminium plates, but a pressurized bag or blimp. The transition from the stick and string and fabric construction of the early aircraft to modern Minoko case was not dictated by some sudden surge of fashion but was a strictly logical step in aircraft design once certain loads and speeds were reached. As we have said, regarded solely as a means of taking compression and bending, the monocoque is always heavier than the space frame. But the extra weight required gets less in proportion as the load on the structure increases. On the other hand, regarded as a means of resisting shear and torsion, the monocoque is more efficient than the space frame. Asterisk as aircraft speeds increase, so do the requirements for torsional strength and logical reversion to space frame construction in modern hang. As aircraft speeds increase, so do the requirements for torsional strength and stiffness. There comes there for a transition point which was reached in the 1930s when it pays. In terms of structure, weight, to change over the construction of airframes from space frame. Monoco, K, this is especially the case with monoplanes. Thus, modern aircraft are usually built in continuous shells using aluminum, sheet, plywood, or fiberglass for the skin. Logical reversion to space frame construction in modern hang gliders, which are very light indeed. The need to resist large torsional loads is almost confined to artificial structures such as ships and aircraft. As we said in Chapter 12, nature nearly always manages to avoid torsion, and thus, at least as far as large animals are concerned, 
Minoko caves or exoskeletons are uncommon. Most sizable animals are vertebrates and therefore highly sophisticated and successful space frames, not very different in their structural philosophy from biplanes and sailing ships. The avoidance of severe torsional requirements is very noticeable in birds and bats and pterodactyls. It is this which enabled these animals to retain their light space frame construction when they took to the air. Aircraft designers, please note. Wow. Sorry about that.